What better way to begin a Sunday morning than with Mozart? <laughs> the land acknowledgement is printed on the screen, but before we enter into that format, I want to say that I was listening to the CBC the other day, and there was someone talking about land acknowledgements. He didn't use this word perfunctory, but I want to use it because when we speak these words perfunctorily, we forget that there is something more important than the words. It's kind of like when we say the Lord's Prayer in a routine fashion and there is nothing significant behind it. So I want to alert you to the fact that this is not merely saying that we live on the land that was originally occupied by our native brothers and sisters. It is much more than that. It is to enter into a relationship with them. So I just thought I'd share that. Let us begin with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we worship and reside on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people. It is in the spirit of reconciliation and in the and right relationships. I'm having trouble seeing that. And working towards this reality that we come to worship the one who will empower and guide us with grace. As we come to the lighting of the Christ candle, let us speak these words in the litany. Dark shadows have covered our world. We light this candle as a sign against the darkness. May our lives be renewed as we live in its glow. And as Len comes to the lectern, we are thinking of all those who have birthdays and other celebrations, and Len will share some of the announcements with us. And you are me. Stack of time. First of all, are there any um, birthday or anniversary announcements? George's birthday today. George's birthday today. Not last week, not any day. Congratulations, George. Carol? Um, yeah, just want to remind everybody that uh, we have uh, still frozen bean pies, and you can still order them downstairs. Uh, just make sure you go to the where we have our coffee. There's a sheet on the table there, and you can sign up for them. And uh, yeah, we're going to go with it. And the pickup is the December the 2nd at 9 o'clock. December the 2nd at 9 o'clock. Any other... Uh, I just want to make one more now. Yes. I know it's in the bulletin, but it's very important that we get our Christmas boxes out to the to uh, 
um, we were told that a volunteer services at the hospital, Hospital Hospital, and I was telling her about our food, our food bag, and our socks box, and our tubes, mittens, and things like that that we gathered for the um, homeless. And she said, well, I wish someone would gather shoes and winter sports wear for the um, mental patients because she said they're starving in need of footwear. And I know the Salvation Army and a lot of groups that groups and cults and that, but that's for the uh, homeless. But this is for the patients at the mental institute up near Buffalo. And she said they really, really need them. So I have two pair already, and I'll be telling a couple more pair. So if anyone has them, I'll pick them up. You can leave them at my house if they're homeless, um, or bring them to the church and do whatever you need. But please, kindly go through your closet and see if you do have some footwear that you're going to throw out or give away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I will begin with these. Um, uh, there's a gospel concert. Be sure to mark uh, November 18th or November 19th on your calendars to make sure you attend St. Andrew's Choir Gospel Concert. The concert uh, will be at 2.30 p.m. Tickets are $15. Um, the Tent Center Community Choir presents the Fall Concert and Silent Auction on Tuesday, November 21st at 7 p.m. in Room 3 at the Thorndale Alliance Community Center. The choir presents a variety of songs and invites the audience to sing along with some familiar tunes. Homemade pies, hearts, squares, and preserves are some of the tasty treats to be had, along with many fun and interesting items on for auction. Admission by donation, uh, call 509-461-1679 for more information. Um, the Bethlehem Walk will be held uh, November the 23rd, 24th, and 25th at Highway Pentecostal Church on uh, Beachville Road, Ingersoll. Uh, this is a very engaging light outdoor uh, drama of the Christmas story of Jesus' birth. Tickets are free, but you must register in advance, phone the church office, or visit the website uh, to reserve your tickets for the time that works best for you. Note that pathways are mulched, so are not easily navigable for wheelchairs, walkers, strollers, and pets. For safety reasons, organizers request that visitors park in the church lot and not on the shoulder of Beachville Road. Screening Party, the new documentary, Invasion, in the era of reconciliation, indigenous land is being taken at gunpoint, will be shown at Wesley Knox United Church uh, on Wednesday, November 22nd at 7 p.m. The documentary is 18 minutes long and will be followed by a discussion of solidarity and possibly next steps. Westminster United Church Transfer presents It's a Wonderful Life, a live radio play on November 24th and 25th and December the 1st and 2nd at 7 p.m. and December the 2nd at 2 p.m. Tickets are $35 each. An Advent Lessons and Carols service will be held Sunday, December the 3rd at 3 p.m. at St. Peter's Anglican Church. Uh, this is a joint service with St. Peter's Anglican Church, Dorchester, Presbyterian Church, and Dorchester United Church. The invitation is extended to the wider Dorchester community to join in this seasonal celebration. I think those are all the events, and now a couple of others. Um, Colleen mentioned the Christmas boxes. Um, Christmas is coming, fortunately. The new gifts vision with uh, gifts with vision catalog is available to help you buy that perfect gift for the person with everything and transform lives at the same time. And effective immediately, and until further notice, our services will no longer be available via Zoom. We will attempt to record the services and post them on the website later on Sunday. And there's a central board uh, meeting Wednesday, November the 29th, at 7 p.m. Please review the information regarding agreement one and come ready to discuss. I think that's it. Thank you, Dan. The call to worship. The prophet says that the day of reckoning is upon us. God, 
The cry for justice is heard in the sanctuary. He believes that the powerful surrounds us on every side. We shall not live in the darkness of hypocrisy. We will renew the covenant with our God. And you notice in parenthesis, this is taken from the fifth chapter of the prophecy of Amos, which we'll be reading a little later in the service. Our first hymn, number 30 in Voices United, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. violence 
between Hamas and Israel that I would like to read to you. A cry to end the violence and to uphold the rights of all civilians to life and freedom from violence and discrimination. We condemn the violence, particularly against Israeli and Palestinian civilians, which constitutes a war crime. The level of human loss and suffering is unconscionable and must stop. We lament the loss of Palestinian voices for peace in international media that fails to distinguish between Hamas and Palestinian civilians. We work with partner organizations in the region, both Palestinian and Israeli, and we hear their cries for a lasting and just peace. For years, Kairos Canada has worked with partners who are supporting local women peace builders throughout the region to know their rights and to build conditions for sustainable, just and equitable peace on the ground. Kairos member churches and agencies also work with a variety of partners in Palestine and Israel on programs of peace, development, education, healthcare, pilgrimage, and humanitarian assistance. I want to pause there briefly and to say that all of these things have been suspended because of the war. These voices are being silenced, and this work is extinguished by the current violence. We join the voices of those in the region and others in Canada and internationally in urging the Canadian government to support a ceasefire and a negotiated resolution to end this violence. And we reiterate that attacks against civilians are in violation of international law regardless of the perpetrator and whether by immediate violence or by long-term structural oppression. Palestinian civilians are not responsible for the crimes of Hamas and other Palestinian armed groups, and Israel must not, under international law, make them suffer for acts they play no role in and cannot control. Canada and the wider international community have failed to uphold international law. The international response must comply with international humanitarian law. We urge Canada to take leadership in calling for a corridor to provide humanitarian relief to Gaza. I will not read any more but simply to acknowledge that the churches are as follows. The Canadian Ecumenical Justice Initiatives of Kairos Canada, the Anglican Church of Canada, Development and Peace from Caritas Canada, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, the Jesuit Forum, that's the Roman Catholics, the Mennonite Central Committee of Canada, the Presbyterian Church in Canada, and lastly but not least, the United Church of Canada. I thank you for listening. Let us pray in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We turn now to Psalm 63 in Voices United, number 781. The sung refrain is the first one.
But the Israelites have misconstrued what Dei Hirai means. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear. Amos and the rest of the prophets are good at metaphors. Or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. The metaphor takes us through different kinds of danger. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? He's trying to correct this false impression of his compatriots that they think the day of the Lord is rejoicing and triumph. And then he goes on, I hate, this is incisive, I despise your festivals and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies, even though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. The prophet is the mouthpiece of God. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The word of the prophet. The hymn at number 701, What Does the Lord Require? Amen. Nearly every U.S. president from Truman to Trump has been influenced in some way by the late evangelist Billy Graham. The preacher's appeal to a worldwide audience gave him access to the White House, especially in the role of religious advisor. Graham followed the tradition of Israel's prophets who always seemed to have the king's confidence. The prophet Samuel became more than an advisor to Israel's first king Saul. Their close friendship would eventually lead to mutual animosity. Whenever you get too close to somebody, you have to be careful. And that's what happened in the case of Saul and Samuel. The story of their broken relationship fills many pages of the Bible. But it was during the divided kingdom 
between Israel and Judah that prophets would openly challenge the behavior of their kings. Historically, it was one people, 12 tribes. The 12 tribes were the sons of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Now, these 12 tribes could not get along. 10 tribes went north and founded Israel. Two tribes went south and founded Judah. The northern capital was Samaria. The southern capital was Jerusalem. The divided monarchy. That's the historical moment at which we pick up the story. Division. Following the death of Israel's wisest king, Solomon, his son Rehoboam succeeded him. But the new monarch imposed heavy taxation on the people and led to the people revolting. You impose heavy taxation and the people will revolt. It's not a new innovation. It's not anything novel. You impose taxation on the people and they will revolt. It was the mid-8th century before the Common Era, a long time ago, when a divided monarchy sent Israel to the north, as I said, with ten tribes under the kingship of Jeroboam and Judah to the south with two tribes under King Uzziah. Israel's capital was in Samaria, while Judah's capital was in Jerusalem. Both the culture and religion of these two cities were separate and distinct. Different religions. The Bible has always favored the kings of Judah and given short shrift to the kings of Israel. There are some Bibles which at the back you will see the list of kings on one side from Israel and the list of kings from Judah on the other. And the ones from Israel are always given short shrift. The ones from Judah are favored. So Uzziah was favored and Jeroboam was not. That's the historical situation. It was the immoral behavior of King Jeroboam and his court, their oppressive ways, their religious fervor, which imitated that of the foreign nations that aroused the anger of the prophet Amos. It was a time of economic growth and expansion for the northern kingdom, for the great empires of Egypt, Babylon, and Assyria were relatively weak. It was a time when the superpowers could not fight a war. So Israel comes on the scene. <coughs> Jeroboam built new shrines in Dan and Bethel and had golden calves made for the people to worship. You remember in the wilderness when Moses was too long gone on the mountain that the people built golden calves to worship. It happened again. This idolatrous cult among the ten tribes to the north became a source of irritation to the prophet and led to his wholesale denunciation of Israel. One writer says, and I quote, sin and evil are so rampant in Israel that destruction, not peace, must be the inevitable outcome. Meanwhile, the Israelites are gearing up for the longed for day of the Lord, Deeds Eri, a time of great rejoicing when Yahweh would come among them and Israel would triumph among the nations. 
And the prophet says that such expectations are a delusion. For the day of the Lord is a day of reckoning for their sins and their vicious, vicious moral behavior. Amos says that Israel is mistaken and issues an invective against their false confidence. One writer described their behavior in the shrines as, and I quote, uninterrupted moral contamination, end of quote. Their forms of worship, the smells and sounds of incense burning left an unpleasant fragrance while their vocals and instrumentals in the temple services were anything but pleasing to the prophet. But it was not the rituals of worship themselves that incensed him. It was the hypocrisy of the people who felt that worship by itself could save them. Their busy activity in the shrines, their feasts of Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles or booths, also known as Sukkot in the Jewish language, their solemn assemblies, their animal sacrifices and cereal offerings, their sacred meals at which parts of the animals killed for sacrifice were eaten did not lead to justice. My dear ones, there can be no orthodoxy without orthopraxy. Right worship must lead to right practice. True worship is not an end in itself, but a means to an end. Fair wages in the marketplace and justice in the courts of law is what the prophet wants for his people. And although Amos is a shepherd from the hill country of Judah, he's from the south and he's critiquing the north, the Israelites would not like that. But he is not prophesying against Israel alone, but against the surrounding nations as well, against the Ethiopians, the Philistines and the Arameans. He abandons his livelihood of shepherding to critique the poverty, greed, privilege, militarization and oppression that he sees all around him. His own country of Judea is in bondage to Israel, which enjoyed extraordinary political power and economic prosperity because of their fertile land. i let that sink in. The prophet is employing graphic language and explicit images when he calls for justice to roll down like a mighty stream and for the waters to cleanse the people from their wicked ways. He says, I hate, I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assembly. It is, my dear people, the very same temple rituals which Jesus would later censure as he moved against the money changers in the temple precincts by overturning their tables. You see, Jesus was against the Jewish temple, and it was because of that that they crucified him. In the exchange of Roman currency for temple coinage, Jesus could see how the poor were being shortchanged. It was the economic prosperity from a flourishing agricultural industry that brought excessive wealth to the northern kingdom of Israel and led to a legion upper class who oppressed the poor and needy that so incensed the prophet. Israel was secure in her wealth, but continued to exploit the poor and the needy. The justice that Amos desires 
is an egalitarian society where human rights are respected and all have equal access to the goods and services of society. I'm quoting from a contemporary writer. And there was God's concern for the poor and the helpless individual, the oppressed, the widow and the orphan is what this is all about. Discrimination seemed to be built into Israel's economic system. The true prophet, and there were many prophets, today we are listening to Amos, the true prophet addresses the situation as if he were the mouthpiece of God, the French call it the pot pahal. And there was economic oppression goes against everything human. And when a people are deprived of food, fuel and water as they are deprived of today, and wholesale destruction and death are unleashed upon them, the words of Amos must be heard again. You know, there is another kind of idolatry besides the worship of molten images. <coughs> it is called militarization. And when modern weapons of war are unleashed against innocent victims, it must break the heart of a God who desires justice and mercy. True justice should be as constant as the waters in a waterfall, says Amos. And we, we who lay claim to our heritage as Christians, have a duty and an obligation to act in the name of the one whom we follow. As the prophet Micah, a contemporary of Amos says, to do justice Love mercy and walk humbly with God is our calling. Amen. God of freedom, God of justice, number 700 in Voices United. <laughs> Welcome those who have been caught in the web of cruelty. 
Show us how we can make our voices heard. May we not satisfy the demands of those in power, even as the needs of the hurting stare us in the face every day. Save us from offering our devotion, however weak, to cheap or easy religion, while you, O oh God, call us to a harder path. Make us wise to discern the evil in our world. In the face of all that is deceptively evil, help us to choose the path that Jesus followed. Bring unity to our divided and hurting world and peace in the walls of incursion. In the midst of the fear and the confusion, the uncertainty and loss caused by natural disasters, provide a steady hope. Reconciling God, may past hurts be forgotten as we stretch out our hands to the need. May we become agents of rest and relief, comfort and healing to the injured and dying. God, we live in a brutal world where the strong exploit the weak, and the powerful have unleashed a reign of terror on the powerless. As we listen to the litany of despair in places whose names are still unfamiliar to us, help us to find ways to lift their burdens and wipe away their tears. In the midst of hardship and challenge, we are grateful for your presence with us in the darkness as in the light. God of justice, too often our worship is empty and hollow. As the prophet reminds us, we recite easy words and perform familiar rituals. We are afraid of speaking truth to the powerful. We are more concerned <clears throat> with seeking material wealth than with sharing what we have with others. We worry more about the physical condition of our homes than with the, the quality of family life within them. We find ourselves so exhausted by all we do that we cannot find the energy or the time to challenge the systems of oppression. Source of our strength, be the wind beneath us as we lift our voice in thankful praise for all you have done to open our eyes to what is really happening in our world. Give us new eyes to probe beyond the hidden and deliberately opaque. As we face these new worlds of pain and suffering, help us to persevere in the quest for change and new life. Amen. In the invitation to invest in God's mission, we share with you the following. The power of the gospel lies in its ability to transcend the limitations of geographical space. The biblical narrative pushes beyond the boundaries of, ancient, of the ancient Near East to our hometowns and those who share our world view. The God of creation, my dear ones, has the world in view when disciples were first sent into Judea and Samaria and the furthest reaches of the space-time continuum. The offertory hymn is at 528 for the gift of creation. Some give because they have seen the need 
and have been changed by what they have seen. These are our gifts, O God. Accept them, bless them, and send them to where the needs of others are greater than ours. Amen. Please be seated. Our closing hymn, O Day of God, Draw Nigh, number six, eight.